Good afternoon to all present. I'm, Ad I'm Adishri and, my, and I'm a research associate with the Center for Urban Planning and Governance at Terry. I would like to welcome you all to the thematic track of the World Sustainable Development Summit, WSDS 2019, on fostering strategic partnerships for cities, integrating the SDG 11 and 17. It is my pleasure and privilege to be among such a diverse audience of urban practitioners and policy makers who are constantly working towards improving the fabric of the cities that we live in. First and foremost, I would like to uh, invite our speakers for the morning. Mr. Dudu Mbai, who's the head for the partnerships and advocacy at the External Relations Division at UN Habitat. Welcome, sir. Mr. Steen Hansen, the Minister Counselor of the Deputy Chief of Mission, Royal Embassy of Denmark of India. Mr. Nicholas Fornage, Country Head, AFT India, French Development Bank. And of course, Ms. Ria Rahman, the Area Convener, Center for Urban Planning and Governance. City to city partnerships are effective mechanisms that facilitate exchange of knowledge and ideas provision of technical assistance and capacity building required for sustainable urban development. City alliances can be instruments in mobilizing resources, enhancing capacities of cities worldwide, promoting cross-cultural learning, and contribute to sustainable urban development. To this end, this thematic track will focus on exploring the interlinkages between the Sustainable Development Goals 11 and 17 and deliberate on existing frameworks of city-to-city -city alliances and how such strategic co collaborations and partnerships can play an integral role for urbanization processes. Joining us later will also be Mr. Sanjay Said, who's the Senior Director for the Sustainable Habitat Division of Terry. To, to begin the session, I would like to invite my colleague, Ms. Ria Rahman, Area Convener for the Center for Urban Planning and Governance for setting the context for the session. Thank you, Adishri, for the introduction. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to welcome you all to this uh, session on fostering strategic partnership for cities. Uh, to start with, I think uh, one, it's probably we could get an overview of what is the current urban agenda like, uh, especially in Indian cities which are rapidly urbanizing. Uh, there are several strains and challenges cities face at the moment. But with the urban missions that are in place, like Amrut, Smart Cities, uh, they are basically aligned towards making cities more sustainable, more livable, though they are mostly uh, driven by developing physical infrastructure. However, uh, keeping this in mind, that's when the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs released the Ease of Living Index, which actually incorporated the aspects of livability so that it can be mainstreamed into the urbanization process. At the international level, the urban discourse surrounds around uh, the SDG 11, the new urban agenda, and also the Kuala Lumpur de Declaration at the World Urban Forum talks about making cities more livable, sustainable, resilient, and inclusive. Now, against this background, uh, Terry, in partnership with the Royal Embassy of Denmark and uh, International Urban Corporation, had conducted a series of policy dialogues against this background of making cities more livable. So during our dialogues, which we had an audience which ranged from city representatives, smart city CEOs, and other uh, representatives of the urban local bodies, it was an interactive discourse dialogues which we had conducted over four uh, regions across India. So basically, a few of the key takeaways that emerged from this session was that the need for a holistic uh, national level framework for urban policy and planning, and also the need for prom promoting social entrepreneurship, private, se private sector participation, and also very particularly strategic partnerships between cities strongly emerged as a key takeaway in these policy dialogues for promoting sustainable urbanization in the cities. So uh, it is in this background that we, uh, we have organized this session with an objective of exploring the interlinkages between SDG 11 and 17. As SDG 11 talks about making cities more uh, resilient, inclusive, sustainable, SDG 7 uh, emphasizes on partnership, establishing, establishing uh, collaboration and partnerships for cities within city-to-city -city partnership between private sector organization, bilateral bodies, multilateral bodies. The whole uh, objective of achieving SDG 11 
and how can we explore the linkage of SDG 7 and how SDG 11 can be achieved through that. So uh, some of the partnerships that generally exist in the cities are the city to city partnership, which could be cities within uh, the particular country or there could be pa pairings happening between a, a national level city and international city. Then as I mentioned be before, partnerships between uh, private and uh, public sector government, uh, private sector entre entrepreneurs then public sector governments and multilateral and bilateral bodies. So uh, the whole idea behind uh, the kind of partnership one has is basically uh, ranging over several themes. Uh, mostly the kind of support cities get either through another city or through a corporation which facilitates such partnerships are generally technical expertise or handholding expertise for capacity building. And also this is a way of d developing a knowledge base a uh, knowledge repository of the best practices that are around the world and so each city can actually adopt or translate or replicate the different best practices relevant to their urban landscape. So one point in the end I probably would like to iterate is the fact that how we need all hands on deck for the kind of sustainable urbanization we are aiming at. So it is with this agenda that we have organized this track in collaboration with the Royal Embassy of Denmark and the UN Habitat. So I really look forward to uh, engaging deliberation and discourse where we'll try to explore the interlinkages and uh, what are the different mechanisms or the frameworks that can be in place for propelling such kind of strategic partnerships. So this is just an overview of the discussion points which we will be exploring in our next technical session, the partnership dialogues. I look forward to a very insightful deliberation ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ria, for setting the context and uh, elaborating on the significance of al aligning with the SDGs to promote sustainable urbanization. I would now like to request Mr. Dudumbai to elaborate upon fostering international partnerships. Good afternoon. Um, I don't know whether I would say I was thrown at the deep end by starting the presentations, or mine is better. Before you get to understand mine, all the ideas begin to flow. Um, I am highly delighted to be amongst you today, and um, uh, I come from UN Habitats, and I am the head of partnerships and um, advocacy. So this is one thing I think uh, which is in the heart of what we are doing now. Hence, since the adoption of the new urban agenda in Quito in 2016 of September. Partnerships, I think, is core to what we are doing to promote our work programmatic programmatically and also as the focal point for the new urban agenda. So let me, um, so as the title goes, Fostering International Partnerships for Sustainable Cities and Communities. I would like to deal with the subject matter, starting from you know, the global agendas, boiling down to what we are doing to promote you know, partnership in order to attain sustainable urban development, then wind down to what we are doing at the country level, and to the extent possible, hence I have the microphone, I would also like to campaign a little bit about one of our events that is coming up in 2020 February some pictorials about Abu Dhabi. I would refer to Abu Dhabi later on. This is just to show UN Habitat um, a kind of footprints the world over, and the colors depict uh, low income, high income, middle income countries where we are present all over the world. We are a UN agency, but a non-resident one. We don't establish country offices unless we have programs or projects running which accommodate personnel costs that would enable us to run offices. So. Um, again, in Quito in September 2016, is it September or October? October, sorry. October 2016, at a United Nations summit called Habitat 3, which is not a UN Habitat summit, mind you, it's a UN summit. The new urban agenda was widely applauded and acclaimed without any reservations. At the time we were going to Quito, I think there was a lot of doubt whether UN Habitat should be the focal point for the new urban agenda. But I guess a lot of work has gone into providing the substantive background or information in sort of crafting the new urban agenda, and that gave a lot of confidence to the second committee of the General Assembly to bestow that responsibility on UN Habitat. And now we are the focal point. In as much as 
the urban landscape accommodates a lot of actors because it's an open-ended landscape with a diversity of actors that should come to play to make us realize the prosperity, the livability, and all those things that we look forward that would call or bring up sustainable urban development. So the new urban agenda, as you see out there, I mean, it's a paradigm shift to what's had been happening. After Habitat 2, where the stress was on partners, mainly the Habitat Agenda partners, there was a shift in trying to see how best we can change the way we plan, we finance, and develop and manage our cities. And so there are these three elements of which, the first is the three informative commitments, that is the social inclusion and ending poverty. You will realize that some of these elements have already surfaced in Reyes' presentation. The prosperity and opportunities for all in the city, and sustainable and resilient development. We all know about the you know, disasters, natural, man-made, what have you. So these are aspects which hitherto has not been given much emphasis in the planning and managing of our cities, but the reality has sunken, and we are taking this into account in trying to have that paradigm shift. Now, the three elements of effective implementation is the governance structure that enables you to plan and manage urban development, and also the planning and managing of our urban space, that is the cities and towns that we all live in. Now, you cannot do this without having a means of implementing whatever good thinking that is in your mind in effectively implementing urban development. Then we have some cross-cutting issues which are fundamental and ought to be taken care of in the process, which is inclusion, innovation, and integration. Then um, uh, I just wanted to share with you also to show in um, uh, the final analysis the strategic plan of UN Habitat. This is work in progress, and we, it is going to take off 2020 and has a lifespan of five years, which is up to 2025. We have four domains of change, as you would say out there. You have um, a reduced spatial inequality and poverty in communities across the urban rural continuum. We also believe that as populations explode, the growth starts within the urban area, but it is a fine line to draw between the urban and the rural. And that should be really properly managed. So this is one I mean, domain of change that Habitat hopes to bring in its work in the future. The other one is, um, uh, again, enhanced shared prosperity. Again, reducing prosperity, pro poverty, and making the cities livable, and uh, making it good for everybody to live within that space. Then our reaction to climate action, our change to climate change. Mitigation, adaptation, and all that is part of the work that we envisage doing within that period of the strategic plan. Then you have the effective urban crisis prevention and um, my class is very small and response. We are trying within one of our thematic branches to develop response mechanisms so that when this happens, we will be one of the first responders to take care of problems that have emanated from this. You have drivers and enablers of change, and there are other cross-cutting issues, and the outcomes are below there. But the domains of change, that's what I wanted to highlight for you all to see where we are going to interact and do some work. Now, coming to the essence or the crux of today's AMA gathering is partnerships and advocacy from our own end. We see the two as, you know, I mean, uh, processes or, I mean, activities that go hand in hand. UN Habitat, as I mentioned, after Quito in 2016, was granted the focal point role for the, I mean, implementation of the new urban agenda. And I believe we all know that the new urban agenda is a means of achieving SDG 11. So one thing we have to do as UN Habitat is to play that focal point role that we've been given. Try to urbanize uh, different streams of work in life as much as possible. We have the UN, the UN system where we feel a lot of the agencies have a role to play in I mean, urban development and managing urban development. And some of them, it has not dawned on them that they have a big role, an important role to play. So we want to bring that alive. There are different approaches. Apart from our campaigns and advocacies, it is envisaged in the new UN development reform system to place urban planners at the level of the resident coordinator's office, so that to the extent possible, when they're doing country, common country assessments, they would have the urban lenses 
to sub be able to identify issues related to urban development. And they will also be able to bring about solutions, planning-wise or otherwise. Now, uh, stakeholder engagement again. We are in the process where we want to develop to the extent possible this kind of engagement. And what we are doing now, before our governing council, which is the UN Habitat Assembly in May, is to come up with a new stakeholder engagement policy. We've realized that from Habitat 2 in Istanbul in 1966, it was an open-ended thing. Anybody that is working within the urban realm automatically qualified as a partner for Habitat or to do work in that realm. Now, the latest was if you are in a consultative kind of status with ECOSOC, you are qualified. If you apply to state your interest in working with Habitat, you are one. But do we know what all our partners are doing in the urban realm? Do you know, we have discovered in instances where people use the logo of UN Habitat to really fleece people. And to the extent possible, we are trying to stop that by coming up with this new process with the help of the NGO committee in New York. That has been approved by our governing body. What is left is the, I mean, accreditation kind of process, which has a little bit of um, uh, contention in terms of the uh, non-objection to potential habitat partners. But I think we will get over it because it's a common problem. Now, evidence-based advocacy is something that we do and the private sector strategy, UN Habitat is to the extent possible working on it very quickly to be adopted during the UN Habitat Assembly in May. This is one area that was not an area of strength for UN Habitat, but we are engaging. And in the SDG fund, we have been kind of called upon to develop an urban financing window and we at Habitat have a mechanism that has, we have developed together with the World Bank as a partner called the Implementation Facility for Sustainable Urban Development called IPSUD. That is to really woo in the private sector and encourage them to the extent possible to invest or be interested in investment or opportunities that present themselves within the urban domain. Again, we are strengthening the voice of the subnational authorities, what you call urban local bodies, I think. They've been there for a long time. We still want them there because they're an effective partner to sort of increase the impact of our work and sort of widen the footprints of UN Habitat wherever we are operating. And then the advocacy platforms. The World Urban Forum, again, it's our premier conference for convening all walks of life that have and do work within the urban realm. And it happens every two years. And it is an opportunity for knowledge sharing. You have networking events, training events, dialogues. A lot happens in that space of five or seven days that we have. And I'll talk to you about the upcoming World Urban Forum. Again, with the World Urban Campaign, it's another platform for private sector involvement in UN Habitat's work. And, um, we have a very wide membership, and the diversity in a membership, you can't imagine. We have just gone online, and we have sort of come up with a call for Urban Thinkers campus proposals, uh, with a deadline of March, to see how much work can be done towards the assembly and towards WOOF. Because this is a possibility or a platform that brings together actors within a country to really dwell on issues of substance to urban planning and something of an urban flavor. Urban October, the UN General Assembly has dedicated the whole month of October as a month that Habitat with its partners can use really to bring alive the subject urban. And um, uh, the first day is usually World Habitat Day and the last day is World Cities Day. There are calls for expression of interest for cities that are really interested in hosting it. And I know all over the world countries, India in particular is very active when it comes to Urban October. Now, a little bit on our work in India, which I will browse through quickly. We have, I mean, the UN has jointly signed um, with the government of India, the United Nations Sustainable Development kind of framework. And um, in 2018, which is going to last from 2018 to 2022. Within the seven focus areas of the SDF, we are involved in the focus area one, which is urbanization, poverty and urbanization. So UN Habitat is a co-convener with UNDP and um, uh, we will be reporting quarterly on USFD outcomes and the critical needs of the government and the private sector will easily come on the fore in terms of um, uh, playing the role we are expected to play within the UNSDF. I cannot really see. Now, just to highlight focus area one, poverty and urbanization, where 
we will be working on with UNDP and mobilizing the rest of the UN country team to provide support to the National Union Government of India to meet their national priorities in this particular focus area. One is um, uh, affordable and uh, what I, I cannot even read. <laughs> sustainable, and sustainable and, um, and resilient housing. The second one has to deal with um, sustainable transport solutions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, cultural, natural, and um, uh, built yeah. heritage, and green and um, safe. safe public spaces. I mean, you will see this has a lot of relationship to SDG 11. And I think in doing the capacity assessment, the UN country team deemed it necessary to have UN Habitat as a co-convener of this particular focus area. Another picture of Abu Dhabi. I'll come to talk about Abu Dhabi. Now, uh, the premier platform, which is really one event every two years that demonstrates the convening power of UN Habitat is the World Urban Forum. I've just drawn a line there from World Urban Forum 1 to World Urban Forum 9 leading to one World Urban Forum 10. You will see the attendance figures and the different kind of themes as well as the, I mean, the locations where it was held. The first one is, was in Nairobi and the last one was in Kuala Lumpur in February last year. And we are planning one in Abu Dhabi, February 8 to February 13. And I want to take this opportunity to invite all of you because I am the organizer of this particular event. <laughs> um, this is just a picture showing the um, uh, closing ceremony of the ninth uh, Urban Forum in Kuala Lumpur last February with figures of about 23,000 people that gathered in Kuala Lumpur to dwell with the new urban agenda because it was the first after the adoption of the new urban agenda. Then the Kuala Lumpur Declaration, which uh, Maria has mentioned, I don't want to spend too much time. I think I've taken enough time. It has three elements. That's the framework for implementation, governance, and partnerships, and innovative solutions. By the way, innovation has been surfacing a lot lately. Nothing to do with frontier technologies, but creative ways of doing things are what we deem as being innovative in general. Now, Wolf 10, which I want to sell because I think that is what earns me my daily bread. In Abu Dhabi, February 8 to 13, ladies and gentlemen, you are all invited to Abu Dhabi. We will be having in 8th of February to 13th of February, series of sessions, dialogue sessions, roundtable sessions, training events, networking events, exhibition, name it. And the attendance we hope to pump up to more than what we had in um, uh, Nairobi. So generally, um, uh, the theme was, is, de is developed with an input from the host country. So Abu Dhabi and UN Habitat were able to sit about four weeks ago and concocted the next theme, which is called the Cities of Opportunities, Connecting Culture and Innovation. Again, as I say, innovation of late will be coming everywhere. We want to sh show how culture has a very positive contributing element in urban development and urbanization from their experience in the Arab world. The non-material and material aspects of culture is tourism kind of aspect, the employment creation aspect, name it. Um, again, that is the conference center where it will be held. For the last sessions, UN Habitat has never been privileged to have a purpose-built conference center like this, which can accommodate a whole lot of, in fact, will be embarrassed by space in the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Center. A part of it, and I just wanted to show the logo for the forum. This is what was re recently approved, and uh, I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you, sir, for letting us know the essential elements of the new urban agenda of the Kuala Lumpur Declaration to have cities for all and highlighting the need for increasing cooperation and partnerships between cities and organizations. May I now please invite Mr. Steen Hansen, Minister Councillor, Deputy Chief of Mission, Royal Embassy of Denmark, to please deliver a special address to the gathering. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak here today and um, 
Thank you to my fellow panelists uh, for also for being here today. We've just heard uh, from uh, from our f the former speaker here from the UN Habitat uh, the grand picture of what uh, takes place in the area of urbanization and the thinking, the heavy thinking that takes place in in in, in these uh, uh, forums uh, that um, that was advocated here. And and so what I'm here to say a little bit about is how we from the Danish side. Uh, bilaterally here in India is working to transform that agenda into something that uh, we have identified as a priority for our work with India um, and uh, to how we can contribute to, to achieving the, the SDGs, uh, in this case uh, SDG 11 and, and 17 not least. Um, let me start by saying that uh, in o October of last year, uh, we, uh, together with, uh, with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, the EU's International Urban Corporation, Terry, and ourselves, published uh, a policy brief which was focused on uh, livability. Uh, it's called the uh, Making Livable Cities, Challenges and the Way Forward for India. And the, the main aim of that uh, policy brief was to uh, take the concept of livability uh, and try to mainstream it into urban planning uh, and policy frameworks uh, at both national and, and sub-national uh, levels. Um, there were three key uh, recommendations from that uh, policy brief. The first uh, being that um, a national level framework that provides for integrated and long-term approach uh, is a required uh, uh, element. Second was um, an empowered uh, urban local body and strong governance structures and institutional capacity at the national and uh, sub-national levels are also another element of, of necessity. And third and not least, and, and this is partly what we're here today for, is the, the strong partnerships that is necessary between cities and stakeholders um, to make uh, this uh, uh, goal, uh, to realize the goal. So it is in continuation of that policy brief that, that we're here today, that we participate here and that we've we would like to contribute to this um, discussion. Um, as I mentioned, uh, focusing on, on SDG 11 and 17, and I don't want to repeat what was said, the connection between the two is, um, is, is I think, uh, straightforward. Uh, you can leverage the partnerships in order to uh, reach the, the various goals, uh, in this case, SDG 11. Um, now, from the, the Danish side, we, uh, we have engaged um, in various partnerships and we're trying to contribute to the realization of SDG 11 at, at multiple levels and through uh, multiple means. And I would just like to highlight four of these means in the context specifically of, of where we are today in India. The first uh, is uh, municipal partnerships. Uh, this was also mentioned by the, the introductory speaker here. It's about city-to-city -city, uh, collaboration. Um, and in, in our case, we have a collaboration between the city of uh, Udaipur in Rajasthan and the city of Aarhus, which in Denmark is the second largest city. I'm not sure uh, that goes for Udaipur in, uh, in Rajasthan, but the two cities are of equal size, and this is actually not a coincidence, uh, uh, even if Aarhus, like I said, is the second largest city in Denmark. But um, what is unique about this particular corporation uh, is that we try to engage um, officials from these two municipalities uh, directly to work together on policy frameworks and, and planning issues. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the other box to stand on, so to speak, as we talk about these city-to-city -city frameworks is the EU, uh, Denmark as a member of the EU, have advocated uh, also this uh, agenda. And um, we have succeeded in, in also channeling the Udaipur and Aarhus uh, municipality corporation uh, to benefit from this uh, EU uh, uh, program, which is um, it, it calls for uh, working on a local action plan, which, uh, and in this case, would be uh, the EU's practice is trying to focus on opening up market opportunities uh, and engaging the, uh, the involvement of partners of businesses also in this uh, collaboration. So that was uh, number one on the, on the city to city uh, level. The second one is uh, at the multilateral level. Uh, and this is, uh, again, the city of Aarhus in Denmark had signed an MOU with the World Bank. Uh, they have a global platform for sustainable cities. 
um, and uh, where uh, Aarhus has signed up as a knowledge partner. So this is an yet another box, if you like, to stand on and to, to leverage these um, uh, networks, uh, existing networks and programs into, uh, into a city-to-city -city collaboration at the local level. Um, so this signature of, of Aarhus was, was actually back in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur at the Urban Forum there. Um, now the third uh, item or third point would be simply straightforward government to government to collaboration. Uh, this is uh, a classic uh, memorandum of an understanding between the, uh, the two governments and in this case uh, one on sustainable urban development uh, which was entered between Denmark and uh, the uh, Indian Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs last year. Uh, based on that MOU, and this is then the, the fourth and final uh, uh, parameter that I wanted to highlight here, uh, we have uh, at the, the embassy side have uh, entered into an agreement with Panachi Smart City, one of the 100 smart cities, uh, to establish what we are framing as an urban living lab, um, and uh, which would uh, serve as a platform for best practices uh, building on the smart city uh, program in, in part. So, so overall, uh, our approach is, is, is focused and concrete on a specific city-to-city uh, -city collaboration that could also be expanded to other cities. Uh, and it is intended to contribute to the achievement of the, the 100 Smart Cities uh, program, as well as the uh, ATSAL mission for rejuvenation and urban transformation. Um, so to conclude, um, as I think, the, as I'm told, the Minister for Housing and Urban Affairs has said before, and he's not the only one, I think is that if uh, the world is to achieve the SDGs, India has to achieve the SDGs. Um, and this is very much something that we have taken to heart uh, in trying to, to work with India on these uh, issues. From our side, uh, what we, the value added that we would like to think that we bring to the table is uh, something about sharing of knowledge and entering into partnerships where there is a mutual benefit, where uh, both, both sides or all sides can see themselves and add uh, genuine value. Um, and we believe that our partnership with Terry and, uh, and the, the UN Habitat is an example of, of such, a, such a partnership. Um, and, uh, and so on, on that note, I, I thank you for your attention and look forward to today's uh, meeting. Thank you, sir, for your valuable insights and remarks and highlighting the importance of city-to-city -city partnerships for achieving the urban agenda, especially giving us a concrete example of a partnership between uh, the city of Aarhus in Denmark and city of Udaipur in Rajasthan. I would now like to request Mr. Nicholas Fornish, country head AFT, the French Development Bank, to deliver a special address. Thank you very much. Right. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, as always a pleasure to be here in WSDS. It's my third WSDS, so I, I guess uh, uh, I'm becoming uh, a bit used to that. Uh, I would like to, of course, uh, give a very warm thanks to Terry for uh, arranging this whole uh, um, uh, and summit, and also to uh, Danish Embassy to uh, in, uh, having supported also this uh, specific uh, SDG 11 and SDG 17 uh, uh, discussion today uh, with a uh, lot of uh, interesting uh, panelists. So I, I would um, give a brief uh, presentation uh, in order to support uh, the illustration of what we can do on a hand-to-hand -hand basis with uh, Indian cities. So of course, this is a point of view uh, from uh, another European donor, from a French development agency. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, we have so far uh, been working uh, uh, mostly on uh, urban settings uh, in India. We have provided uh, uh, nearly 1.7 billion euro total funding uh, to urban, mostly urban development projects in India, mostly in tier two cities and uh, from 2015 on mostly uh, to smart cities. So, uh, as you know, uh, we have been working more specifically on uh, three cities in, uh, in India, which are basically uh, Chandigarh, Nagpur and Puducherry. 
um, uh, we have been working with them with a pool of experts uh, from France which has been um, uh, a success because it was uh, uh, the possibility for the cities to um, um, request specifically experts on the subject they wanted meaning uh, because it was from a pool of experts 35 experts then if they wanted the people to bring them support on uh, solid waste or on the legal aspect or financial aspect it was possible for us to deliver that so this was very successful and the three cities have been of course uh, uh, have seen their smart city proposal approved uh, in, in uh, no time. And uh, so I would elaborate just a bit on this program, which is called Cities. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting project regarding uh, sustainable urban development. Uh, it's interesting because we are the first donor to do that in India. We, are, we have been uh, providing a 100 million euro credit line uh, uh, to uh, government of India. This has been uh, supported by a 6 million euro grant from European Union, uh, which is bringing actually uh, technical assistance and expertise uh, to the whole uh, process. The interesting point is that it's exactly like the smart city mission itself. It's a challenge process, meaning that we, we uh, inform the cities of the different uh, topics we wanted to work with, uh, we, we, uh, to work uh, on with them. And we launched uh, um, basically a challenge process. So it has been, uh, it was finished and by end November. Our, our colleagues from NIUA are uh, supporting us as an implementing agency for, for this program. So I'm glad that uh, they are represented here in this room. Uh, and I, I say hello to them. Um, so um, basically this program uh, will bring, uh, will finance at the end of the day 10 to 15 innovative projects on sustainable urban development, basically on SDG 11. Um, they will, they will uh, get a grant from 3 to 10 million euros each uh, if their project is selected, of course, and uh, there will be a tailor-made uh, mentorship which will be brought uh, to them with uh, uh, experts coming from India but also from Europe. Um, so wh where do we stand on this specific program? Uh, so we have launched the challenge process. 36 smart cities have answered and they have proposed to us 67 different projects on the uh, four topics which are mentioned here. So most of them were on public open spaces, 19 were on sustainable mobility, 11 were on e-governance and uh, ICT, and finally nine were on social innovation for low income settlement. So I'm glad that this is fully aligned with what with the different priorities uh, already uh, mentioned by uh, UN Habitat uh, at the beginning of this afternoon. So the, the process is uh, nearly finalized now. By 26 February, we'll be able to know which city will be officially uh, selected uh, after this process. And interestingly, this is the map. Uh, this is the places where uh, came from the projects from the smart cities. So meaning that we have four states which are uh, equal on the number of uh, projects presented. Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Karnataka, and Madhya Pradesh. After that, Tamil Nadu. The, the three uh, cities supported by France, uh, Nagpur, Chandigarh, and Puducherry, has present, have presented uh, six projects by, by themselves. So uh, uh, we are very much looking forward to implementing this program now, because, but at this, at this day, we don't know yet which will be the project presented by the city and the project finally selected. So it's a very uh, innovative process, and we are eager to see what would be the project uh, ultimately um, uh, funded. funded. And in order to complete that with a um, different topic uh, about the fact that we are promoting a city to city uh, relationship and cooperation according to SDG 17. Uh, I have just one example here. I will maybe uh, bring you a second example afterward, but this one is about the city of Lyon. Uh, two million people, uh, second city of France. Uh, they are, uh, they, we, we work with them uh, and with the city of Kochi in order to elaborate together uh, the, the mobility plan for the, for the Kochi metro. And uh, uh, as of now, there was a huge uh, and very significant exchange of experience on both sides. And both, it goes both ways. Uh, the French city of Lyon also learned quite a lot. The interesting point is that we put in relation not the city to the city, but the Urban Transport Authority of Lyon with the Urban Transport Authority of Kochi, meaning that it was a slightly lower level. However, it was hugely successful, and now we can say that uh, this experience was very successful in, uh, in, uh, for, for the city of Kochi. Um, and to conclude, uh, I would like to uh, mention that uh, clearly uh, we have uh, um, both contributing to SDG 11, sustainable uh, urban development with a program like Cities, but also with all the other projects we are funding. 
uh, on uh, mobility, urban mobility, on uh, uh, water and sanitation, and all the other very important aspects of the cities. Uh, so this is fully the objective of, uh, of uh, this program. However, we also promote every time possible direct relationship between, uh, between uh, cities. Just to give you a last example, maybe, uh, where, uh, so under the cities program, the city of Puducherry presented to us a very uh, innovative project on how to use a blockchain uh, uh, methodology to secure uh, providing of uh, administrative uh, documents to people. So meaning that how can we protect and make sure that there is a full security for the uh, um, uh, important administrative document delivered by the city to the, to the, to the citizen, uh, just with the example of the land, uh, land titles, uh, which might be uh, um, delivered under this technology. So meaning that it's not only uh, uh, interesting um, digital operation, but it's also something which is not existing now in France. So at the end of the day, what we hope is to make sure that this uh, experience we uh, hope to develop in Pondicherry will be directly uh, used also by cities in France, according to UN Habitat uh, um, and DRIVE. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Your words are extremely encouraging for us to actively work towards developing strategic partnerships towards sustainable urban development. With this, we conclude with the introductory section. And uh, can I please request Ria to uh, present tokens of appreciation on behalf of Terry, Royal Embassy of Denmark, and UN Habitat to our distinguished speakers. To Mr. Dudu Mbai. To Mr. Steen Hansen. And to Mr. Nicholas Farnett. I would like to request Ria to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Adishri. At the outset of uh, uh, this event, uh, on behalf of Terry, uh, the Royal Embassy of Denmark, and UN Habitat, I would like to express my deep gratitude to all the distinguished speakers for sharing their thoughts perspectives on this very important uh, session on fostering strategic partnership for cities. I would like to thank Mr. Steen Hansen for his special remarks. It was our privilege and honor to have you here, sir. I would like to express my deep gratitude to Mr. Rodu maybe for sharing his insights from his experience of heading the partnerships and advocacy at the external relations department at the UN Habitat. I would also like to thank Mr. Nicholas Furnish for sharing his perspectives on the various initiatives AFD is in collaboration with, especially the smart cities of India. Thank you, sir, for your insights on that. Last but not, not the least, I would like to thank all my colleagues of the Center for Urban Planning Governance Division and Terry, the UN Habitat and the Royal Embassy of Denmark for helping us in facilitating this session and which this particular session on the very integral topic of fostering strategic partnership for cities. Uh, thank you so much, the audience, for being here. Now I look forward to our technical uh, session, that is the partnership dialogues, where we'll be actually deliberating on various topics from different representatives that are present here. Thank you all. Thank you to our speakers. Following from our previous session, we would now commence with the partnership dialogue session on fostering strategic partnerships for cities and build upon the immense potential that partnerships have towards mobilizing resources, enhancing capacities of cities worldwide, and promoting cross-cultural learning. Our esteemed chair is already on the dais for us, so please, please have a round of applause to welcome him again, Mr. Durumbai. And I would like to call upon our panelists for the session. 
Mr. Mohammad Ridwani, the Honorable Mayor of the City of Leuven of Belgium. Mr. Anand Ayer, <laughs> Chief Project Manager for the National Institute of Urban Affairs. Ms. Shabnam Siddiqui, Director, CEGET, UN Global Compact Network India. Welcome, ma'am. And Ms. Camilla Christensen Rai, the Councillor for Urban Development in the Royal Danish Embassy of New Delhi. Unfortunately, Mr. Mahesh Harhare, who was another panelist for the session, was unable to join us due to some last minute personal commitments, and he sends across his sincere apologies. May I please request Mr. Mbai to take forward the discussion? Uh, um, good afternoon. Um, thank you for staying. I've been given the microphone again. I hope I won't bore you that much. But it is widely um, believed among development practitioners that the role of cities is very important in the achievement of sustainable development. And the re realization of this reality calls for resource mobilization uh, towards funding urban development. Thus, there is the need to upscale collaborative efforts between communities, cities, local governments, and their respective associations. So city to city is a decentralized kind of cooperation between two or more cities from different countries, and sometimes from the same country. Now, I just want to highlight examples of successful city-to-city -city collaborations before I let the panel go, I mean, go on the discussions. There's the European Union city-to-city -city cooperation, and I think the French, um, uh, Musée Fornage, uh, told us something about it. Um, it's a cooperation at regional and international level to contribute to the implementation of the new urban agenda. Um, uh, to develop capacities and foster exchanges of urban solutions and mutual learning. Under this program, cities are selected to peer and uh, with like-minded partners and develop, implement through a participatory process over a period of time, having local action plans on a common urbanization priority defined by the two cities, like Mr. Fornais has just um, uh, given an example of the cooperation between um, uh, uh, the French city of Lyon and the city here in India. Now, um, uh, there is also the UL, UCLGs, I mean, um, peer learning exchange, which is also another form of decentralized cooperation. And um, it's a key focus of UN, UCLG, I mean, activities. Under the peer learning program, UCLG facilitates dialogues around urban strategic planning to promote South South learning and um, uh, mentoring in order to build coherence with the agenda of members and other partners on specific issues in all regions, because UCLG is all over the world with chapters in the different continents. Now, though one of its flagship pro programs, City to City program, CityNet, has facilitated over 500 city exchanges, addressing infrastructure, climate change, SDGs, disaster, mitigation, adaptation, name it. Now, let me just highlight some success in city to city cooperation before I hand over the microphone. There's the strong political commitment that is needed from the parties that enter into such a type of engagement. There is the need also to mobilize communities and live within the cities to be a part and parcel of the process. There is need to be a good understanding of the potential benefits and the challenges alongside the I mean, partnership as it goes on. And there's the need also to recognize that there is to be reciprocity. It should not be one-sided. One gives, the other takes. The other gives, the other takes. So that will bring about some kind of mutual kind of relationship. Then concrete results at the community level is always needed. So the key performance indicators should be set from the word go. Then there should be the continuous flow of information between these two, I mean, city to city kind of um, elements that are cooperating. And there is the need also for support from all levels of government. And finally, there is always cost involved. Sometimes it could be shouldered by one party, but it's also good if both parties can come to the table and provide part of the funding of this kind of exchanges. So, ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, I would invite Mr. Ridwani to come in and take over the microphone or from your vantage point, you can use the mic and uh, share your experiences with us. I thank you all.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for having us here. Um, it's an honor to stand before you here as the mayor of the city of Leuven, which is situated in Belgium. And uh, Leuven is um, mostly known for two things. First of all, for its uh, long-standing history about uh, science and knowledge. We have one of the oldest and most renowned universities on our soil, being uh, the Catholic University of Leuven. And secondly, uh, we are the hometown of Stella Artois, which is uh, also one of the most renowned uh, drinks in the world. So um, thank you for having a short moment to present to you uh, what we call our Agenda Leuven 2030. Leuven 2030 is about a shared agenda, a shared ambition um, for the future, where in fact, instead of having the city doing all the planning and taking the measures, we have created a new organization, a new governance model, which we call um, Leuven 2030. And its partners consist, and they are all here today, they're present, they consist of what we call our ecosystem. So it's a collaboration, a common agenda, a new governance model between the government, the city of Leuven, between, uh, and uh, it's including the university and our colleges and the knowledge institutions. And it includes entrepreneurs, companies, and especially also our, what we call civil society, NGOs, schools, etc. And these four dimensions have created Leuven 2030, which is really uh, an organization above all of them, and which has the duty, and these are the partners, some of the partners today, in fact, it's the largest NGO in Leuven today, uh, which is sustained by almost everyone in our um, community. And this organization has the duty to uh, coordinate all the climate action plans of the partners to measure what is happening on the floor, to make sure that uh, people get engaged and that we have a shared dream, as we call it. There are three success factors. First of all, it's making sure everyone feels involved, meaning that uh, social power, as we call it, um, is very, very important in this. It's about doing away with CO2 emissions, right? By 2030, we want to become climate neutral. Uh, by declining at least 75% of our CO2 emissions uh, on our soil. This is our objective. But if you go outside on the streets, this will not motivate people. So to do so, we have included so many people and we tell the story um, about making our city healthier, more livable and more prosperous. This is in fact the aim that motivates people, motivates NGOs, schools. Our pupils are very, very engaged in this. Secondly, the storytelling, again, we look at success stories, things that work, and we try to, um, to tell them to people by ambassadors, people that really are performing these actions. And we, shouldn't be, we wouldn't be a city of knowledge and science if we wouldn't measure what's happening. So together with um, our university, we have a, a big roadmap. And in fact, when we started in 2013, we made... Um, let's say, a, a zero-point analysis, where we looked at where are these CO2 emissions coming from and what are the big areas of action. And this is done by our scientists and then, in fact, carried out in collaboration. Since then, many, many projects have been carried out by all the partners together on the level of uh, uh, renewables, mobility, um, insulation of buildings, um, green management, water management, and so on resulting last year, in fact, in the prize given to us by the European Union as being the green leaf of 2018. It's basically the most prestigious prize you can get from the European Commission. And they awarded us with the prize because we have taken so many measures, also difficult ones, and secondly, because we've done that together. Because we had Leuven 2030 as a common agenda, as a common organization, we have also been rewarded as one of the six I capitals in Europe, and uh, we are part, of course, of the large SDG program of the of the UN. We are one of the of the members of it. And if you look at the emissions today, our city is growing very fast. We are a university city. We attract a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurship, 
And still we look, it's not going as fast as I would like, as I would love, but the CO2 emissions are going down steadily. And in some domains, like uh, in the areas of the families, not the entrepreneurs, they go down very fast. So I believe that, uh, you know, the, the green uh, bar at the end, this is our objective. So we need to do uh, even more our best. But in a growing scenario, we're tackling the beast of CO2 and we are successful in doing so and in measuring it. The roadmap, I already talked about that. A lot of people, a lot of scientists have... Um, done this it's a clear roadmap towards 2025 35 and 2050 um, where we have also the scope is very clear we are focusing on mobility 25 percent of co2 emissions and we are focusing on buildings buildings are responsible for 60 percent of our co2 emissions so uh, we need to work on the on the fossils we work on different clusters i won't go into detail i will just mention a couple of practical um, actions we're taking, buildings, 60% of emissions. So we need to um, insulate them, renovate them. And when we build new buildings, they should be climate neutral. So either not using energy at all, or it should be renewable. We have, and therefore we need to cooperate with other cities and share knowledge. A city like Leuven is an old ancient city, and we have these old heritage buildings, and we're proud of them. But of course, you cannot start breaking them down and, uh, and insulate them. So how do you tackle that? How you, can you heat up an, an old building without um, demolition of the heritage? Mobility, that's another one. If you visit Leuven, and I welcome all of you to do so, uh, you will see that it is a very calm, relaxed city where you can walk around and you can cycle around, but it has been different in the past. But I can tell you as a policymaker, as a politician, as a mayor, it's not easy taking these measures. Uh, we have made our city center, uh, let's say, almost car free, but it takes some political courage because in the beginning, people will not reward you for that. But after some time, when they see the benefits, meaning your public space is becoming safer, nicer to walk around and to, and to bicycle, especially for the youngsters, then uh, people come to um, understand why it's necessary. Renewables, very important. We need to step up on that. Um, as I said, we have a clear action plan if the slides will follow me. Consumption is another one. We have uh, an action plan so that uh, consum consumption could be more sustainable, more locally focused and uh, working together with the farmers. Public space, important, and uh, governance and financing. We work together with our financial institutes so we can find financial models to do all these investments because it has been calculated that um, to get there in 2030, it would require investing 300 million euros a year in all of these domains by all of these actors. That's a huge investment, of course, and therefore we need to be creative on that. This is our city hall, by the way, very proud of it. Um, our main objective to go towards conclusion is that, um, and I've just started as a mayor in January, I was deputy before, um, and uh, the local government has a clear vision by 2030, we really want to be one of the most livable, sustainable cities in Europe. And we believe that by getting there, we will need to cooperate with our knowledge institutions, with our companies, with our students, with our scientists, and uh, with our uh, local uh, governors. Just to conclude, um, Mr. Chairman, um, we are also very convinced that it's not only about local cooperation, but also about regional cooperation. We have very good friends in, uh, in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, cities that we collaborate with in Scandinavia, um, but we are also included in uh, different European frameworks, and I can tell you, we're here in, uh, in Delhi, New Delhi. We have a close cooperation with, uh, with New Delhi, where we also have a focus on sustainability, water management, air quality, etc., which we will take further in the next years to come. So um, once again, thank you. We're here with the delegation of the city, university, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce and our college. So if you would have further questions on the, the process, because we're not a large city, but I think the process is important of collaborating locally 
and internationally, uh, we are most happy to share that experience with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Maire. Mais mes excuses les plus sincères. Hein? J'ai pas pu vous Merci. présenter, mais quand même, je pense que votre délégation est contente de votre présentation. Um, I was just thanking the um, uh, mayor Some and uh, presenting my excuses for not having presented him before his intervention. <laughs> Actually, there was an email exchange. Il y a eu une échange d'email, and we agreed that we don't have enough time to, you know, read the story of everybody. So. Uh, with special permission from the chair, uh, there is a slight deviation from uh, the panel discussion that we are having because uh, we had an MOU signing in the morning and uh, Mr. Sanjay Seth, our senior director, has joined us for the same. Uh, corresponding with the theme of fostering partnerships, Terry and UN Habitat will be signing a memorandum of understanding to collaborate in carrying out activities relating to research, knowledge sharing, advocacy, and capacity building for strengthening the localized and scale-up implementation of the SDGs, which is very much in theme for today. The new urban agenda and other global development frameworks. May I take this opportunity to please invite Mr. Sanjay Seth and Mr. Bai to do the honors of signing the MOU. Uh, I'm extremely sorry, the esteemed panelists. I'm really, really sorry for doing this, to taking away your presentations and coming in to sign. I was upstairs, and apologies for this. I had to be, uh, we, you know, we, it's just a way of fostering our partnerships between you and Habitat, and we work very closely with them. And I thought that signing an MOU would further uh, augment this partnership that we have. So with the permission of the audience, the esteemed panelists, may I have the privilege of signing with you, the thank you very much. Yeah. Come, please, up to you, sir. I can I sit here? Uh, let me just say, um, I've also have a delegation here. We have the head of our India country office, Mr. Hitesh Vedia. Please come forward. Um, uh, our regional officer for UN Habitat based in Fukuoka, Japan, Mr. Lars Strodel. Please come around. Chaitanya of our Indian office, you can come behind and join us here in signing. It is a real pleasure we to you know have such agreements with knowledge partners and Terry. Thank you very much. We are glad to be with you here to sign this we and look hope forward to it. We will do a lot with this. Thank you. So I sign on the you yeah. sign each page. Yeah. And I sign on the right, you sign on the left. left okay. All right. All right. We initial all pages and The annexes, the annexes. Double side. Double side, yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't. Wow, I've jumped everything. That's why I was wondering how did you do it so fast? <laughs> Thank you. 
one more? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Panelists, thank you very much for it. Uh, Okay, thank you very much for your patience. We hit the ground running again. And um, again, I would, um, as I said, um, uh, I presented my apologies to the mayor of Louvain. And now I want to call the next um, panelist. And uh, Mr. Ayer, I would give you the opportunity to introduce yourself before you get going with the subject. Sure. And I was hoping to be as brief as possible. <coughs> So I'm Anand Ayer and I work with the National Institute of Urban Affairs. Uh, we are a policy and research think tank with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. So we work at central government level, but we do work, end up working with all the cities as well. Our um, role's a little peculiar in the sense that uh, land is a state subject. The cities govern themselves as per state laws. But the central ministry does float schemes. It does float missions, guidelines, policies for the whole country. And our role is to advise that, is to preempt issues, and on those implemented audit as well. So that's NIUA. Um, I've been with them for a couple of years looking across projects and helping the organization uh, grow, transition to another level. Right, so I'm going to go uh, straight into uh, the couple of discussion points that had come uh, as a part of this panel discussion, which said uh, lessons and experiences. If you've worked with partnerships, what are your lessons and experiences? And how do you leverage them towards sustainability? So these are the two things that I'll try to attempt through what we've done. Um, so a couple of premises first. You know, any partnership, any partnership has to be based on synergy. There has to be something that you draw from each other. And there has to be a kind of a long-term commitment to that partnership. So there is something that the partnership is going towards, as well as each of you see your individual growth in it. Now, this sounds theoretical, this sounds simple, but uh, the minute you apply it to partnership between cities, it's good to ask these questions again. Um, I like the word that Ria used at the beginning, um, saying strategic partnerships. And therefore, it's well worthwhile to uh, focus on the word strategic. And I'll illustrate how, we, how what I mean. Partnerships between cities sound simple enough, but you see there are different kinds of cities. In their fundamental makeup, in who they are, they're different. This is not to say that every single city is unique, which they are, which it is, but to at least recognize that there are types. One has to be strategic in knowing that. The second is to be knowing that there are different kinds of partners. Again, it's just two words, strategic partnership, partnership between cities, but to know that there are different kinds of partners, again, fundamentally in their makeup, who they are. You know, as an organization, for example, NIUA is making a change from a fundamental research organization to an applied research organization. These are words, but I cannot tell you how difficult it is because the people, the actual person who conducts research, the makeup of one who conducts idealistic fundamental research is different from the one who does applied research. So these are not words, these are actually issues when you hit the ground. So different kinds of cities and different kinds of partners and one has to be strategic about this before you evolve any uh, partnerships and then there are nuances I'll tell you a simple thing you know again Ria in the, I think the first slide said cities are growing India is urbanizing almost every single paper that we will get will start with these kind of words and you know that it could be flawed you know we have a senior professor at NIUA who insists on starting every presentation that she makes regardless of the topic to first of all state that India is not urbanizing or that cities are not growing. And she's got data enough to prove, demographic data, NSSO data, that cities are shrinking. It is nomenclature-wise those entities that earlier weren't cities that are becoming cities now that lead to this understanding that cities are growing. It is more things that are becoming cities. It is the periphery of cities that are growing which today are not cities yet. They are urban agglomerations agglomerations are growing. Now, this is not to pick hairs. This is not to get into semantics of what a city is, but to understand that when you establish a partnership with a city, do you know whom you are establishing it with? Is it with the old city that is shrinking? Or is it with the periphery that you don't know of? 
who are you establishing a partnership with so all i'm saying is it's nuanced and you got to be strategic anybody who's strategic has to have two views one is on where we are going and one is on the next step that we are taking and these both have to be aligned yeah so this in in a way forms my uh, you know the core of my lessons and learnings cities need a few things for this synergy but they also need it at a particular time and they need it in a particular way therefore you will find different cities in their growth paths in their own curves of evolution needing something at some time and not the other needing something in a particular way and not the other when one forges partnerships you have to be sensitive to that particular thing and if you catch two cities on their with the same mental makeup not to mention the same geoclimatics and other you can't match all the criteria i could sit here and list down 20 criteria that you must do before you pair up cities you cannot meet all of them it's like a horoscope for god's sake but you know at least you got to match a little bit of mental makeup and growth curve to know that synergy then makes sense that you will get more than the sum of the parts yeah so there is the context of course there is the context there's also an ecosystem in cities and this ecosystem consists of governance it consists of the people who run it the human resource and it consists of an overall ethos that the city has this includes citizens this includes officials it's an organism and therefore it's the behavior of an organism this is what i call an ecosystem a city is governed by a set of laws it's governed by a legislative framework that is operated in a certain way as the constitution of that place mandates therefore you cannot pair up a city which has control over a b c d features of itself with another that has does not have that control so in india you can pretty much take that waste for example waste management is central but the minute you get into power the minute you get into transport the minute you get into water you are by default going to have ministry of power or new and renewables you are going to have irrigation you are going to have road transport the city does not have complete control on those topics therefore pairing a city along the governance framework and i'm only taking this one example of of jurisdiction and law it's allocation of responsibilities to derive maximum benefit and to not have one city come back and saying i had a lovely vacation in europe oh it is such a terrific place i can't do any of those you see i i don't govern them it is a flaw in the project design of pairing all i'm asking for is a little sensitivity to this and this is very simple you focus on the word synergy again find out what will enable the growth of both and do role definition in the partners so pairing is just one example which maybe the eu and the iuc does but a lot of projects require a lot of partners i mean there are knowledge partners different from implementing partners different from funding partners and you got to define the roles of each and you got to define the roles with the outcome and this is what i come back to first where do you want to go why are you partnering where do you want to go and therefore in wanting to go from a to b i mean this is 101 strategy and planning what is therefore the next step that you take and that in each step inherent at some pace or the other individual growth is ascertained so you may be slow your benefits might come much later but surely you realize that it is for me to go slow now and be a part of the partnership and to reap the benefit when something comes at a certain stage so this is all that you know these are the kind of things that lessons and experiences i just end with two best practices i mean or two practices that uh, kind of say this um we have a we have an online platform at the nia called smartnet it's about half a dozen years old now and it is grown like a child we are pretty much born out of nobody's need except nia's own it is still not funded by anybody except the national institute of urban affairs smartnet.niua.org for whoever is interested it's a peer to peer learning platform but the, the the fantastic thing is it's called smartnet it has nothing to do with the smart city because it was born before the smart city mission it is only a peer to peer platform it has resources available it has resources you know if you are a city 
you need knowledge on a topic. I want to know about town planning schemes. I want to know about financial allocation. I want to, there's knowledge on a topic. There's knowledge on a process. I want to build an outer ring road. Can you take me through it? What all do I need and when? I want to cut down my emissions. I want to get some adaptation measures. This knowledge on a topic is different from knowledge on process and knowledge on documents. I need to release a tender. That's my job. I want to release a tender tomorrow. Give me 20 tenders. I'll choose from them. That's just knowledge on documents. While inherently I know that I can't just pick up the first document in life and print it. It's too risky. But I first need the 20 documents. That's knowledge on documents and then knowledge on people. We were at a city the other day and the commissioner wanted something. He had been wanting it for quite some time and somebody managed it in five minutes. They said, how did you do this? He said, you know what, I just called my counterpart in another city. That's because SmartNet said that we released a similar tender. They just borrowed notes and did the match. So that's knowledge on this. The other thing we're doing is a data observatory. I'm glad my colleague Raina is here. And the lovely uh, map that um, Major Ridhuni also showed. The four components, business, government, communities, organizations, as well as academia. There's a lot of balancing in any partnership. You're using public money. You need public trust. There needs to be checks and balances. Four areas of checks and balances. There's something objective about a topic called climate change, but there's something subjective about the way it gets done in a neighborhood. For waste management in one neighborhood, you may need to give bins. In another neighborhood, you may need to remove bins. It is waste management, but the act you do is different. So there's objective and subjective, and having more partners balances that out. There's the idealistic, theoretical, and the realistic. So it's good to have the academic institutions, but good to pair them with a the government organization. There will be friction, there will be fights, there will be, but that's the joy of a good partnership. There's the larger objective and the smaller scale. And finally, functional, doable, but yet unbiased. Now, that's a tricky one. To not be allegiance to or not have a bias or buy into one particular way of thinking, one advocacy, one pressure. So that's why you, you match your partners first. That's it. Thank you so much. Well, I I want to thank yeah no, I have it. I want to thank Anand for his uh, my intervention. I wish I took note of his cautionary advice of being brief. <laughs> anyway, it was good to hear him. You know, warn people or city leaders about being very careful about pairing of cities the typology of cities, what cities have to offer, what they cannot offer, and you have to match, I think, equal cities. And also the objectives of the partnership should be well known, and to see the level of trust because of what it brings to the table, as I mentioned earlier. So here we are, just a very interesting one, follow, you know, following that of our Lord Mayor of Louvain, who talked about climate change and the efforts of Louvain. I must say, these are very gigantic steps that you are taking. And as you said, to start with, it's very difficult, some of the initiatives. Because for the citizens to appreciate the benefits, it takes time, the gestation period for it to materialize. So I wish you well, and we hope we can visit you in Louvain to see some of the you know, results that you kind of garnering in Louvain. Um, if you will allow me, I will now bring our dear colleague, Shabnam Siddiqui, Madam. The floor is yours. Please introduce yourself and uh, briefly deal with the subject. And now I use briefly. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Shabnam Siddiqui. I represent the Center of Excellence for Governance, Ethics, and Transparency at the United Nations Global Network India. Uh, the United Nations Global Compact is a UN initiative for businesses, essentially, established in 2000. Uh, by a partnership that was the first kind of partnership that developed between the UN system and businesses. The idea being that since businesses are a part of a lot of societal problems, how can they be a part of the solution? Uh, what was agreed upon uh, at the start of this uh, millennium was that uh, businesses came together around four issue areas that were uh, extremely important, human rights, environment, labor, and anti-corruption. The idea is that businesses who are working within the Global Compact, uh, in India we have around 350 members, 
globally we are 12000 plus uh, across 169 countries uh, the idea is how are each of these uh, uh, members what are they doing on these four principles and they report on something called the communication of progress so every year they have to make an effort which does not mean that every year they have to give us uh, something that worked or like you know a best practice they have to tell us what they did did it work did it not and if it did not work what is the peer learning that can happen in different uh, air, like across geographies across sectors we have multiple platforms globally uh, multiple themes uh, so we have something a stream on business and human rights we have on climate action uh, the topic of the day today, uh, today we uh, the india network especially has been working uh, on the cities uh, the smart cities especially uh, so uh, we have connected the smart city mission of the country with sdg 11 So right from the time that we started working in 2015 on the cities our focus was always on uh, the sustainable aspect uh, the sustainable cities and communities as well as partnership what we have been through in the process is uh, stakeholder consultations like many of us in the room here we have physically visited cities uh, to see uh, what uh, the professionals in that uh, city uh, had to say what were their dreams what were their aspirations what were the challenges that they foresaw and how could it be worked out based on these uh, different stakeholder consult consultations we have come up with uh, tools so there's a tool for governance of uh, uh, the, uh, there's a governance framework for smart cities there's a handbook on public private partnership because every city that you meet uh, even the national government everybody talks about ppps the government is very fascinated very encouraged by ppps but unfortunately many of the ppp uh, works projects do not see a successful ending uh, have had a lot of challenges so what are the challenges that can be looked at and how it can flow and finally we have something called the risk assessment and mitigation toolkit uh, which is different for businesses because the risk that a business has of investing in government projects is different vis-a-vis -vis the risk that is there for business so there are two different kinds of assessment and mitigation toolkits uh, once we had all these uh, toolkits and frameworks and knowledge uh, products developed we wanted to pilot it in a city so we uh, entered a formal partnership uh, in one of the cities uh, where we have a five year uh, ad governance advisory kind of a, a assistance that we are providing and initially what we assisted them was with about uh, basic things that the business does a business knows how to run business extremely well so what are the procurement uh, uh, challenges how is procurement done how do you get uh, a, a bid process uh, involved how do you get the right kind of partners uh, in the process because if you have a uh, good uh, compliant partners which is already working on sdgs or adhering to sdgs then a lot of the uh, heartache afterwards uh, once the project gets rolled out gets covered so this is the kind of broad uh, road map that we have been working with essentially uh, we are a network of businesses the private sector engagement which is uh, like rising up uh, in today's times last year we were also given like last december the global compact had a new mandate and the new mandate is to more engage with governments because government engagement has not been uh, part of our initial mandate uh, since we were an exclusive uh, business uh, principal business approach association uh, and also that uh, now the link between uh, the missions of the government and the private sector is the startups so what are the innovators doing in different spaces and how can we leverage and uh, take things further So essentially, uh, the Global Compact Network India is a neutral platform. Uh, if we think of a, a sustainable solution that is really fascinating and can be leveraged, like last week uh, we met a partner in uh, in the South India, and they were looking something at intermediate public transport, which sounded fascinating because they've given a solution moving from non-sustainable to sustainable solutions. So we have like when they came to Delhi uh, and they wanted a, a different group of stakeholders. we have facilitated that so that is the kind of broad agenda that we've been working on uh, private sector engagement uh, with principles completing the sdg targets uh, we have now requests from cities to evaluate them on sdg uh, uh, like you know targets and indicators because people think that once you have uh, like a water harvesting project then that you're completely sdg compliant so we are see, we are trying to uh, but it's a good uh, inroad because through that what we can do is uh, we can get the focus of these very cities uh, the multiple cities that anand has mentioned about and how to get whether it's a smart city or not but to move everybody to a sustainable uh, city because that is what is most required in our country today thank you shabnam i'm very sorry for putting you under pressure um uh, but i know you had a lot to tell us particularly about uh, the compliance issues that um, uh, 
private sector have to, you know, you will have to contend with when dealing with the private sector. I will quickly, if you will allow me, call on Madam Rai, who is Councillor for Urban Development in the Danish Embassy. Thank you very, thank you very much. Of course, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to make this uh, thematic track together with uh, Terry and UN Habitat. It's a, gr a great pleasure from the uh, Royal Danish Embassy. I, I want to uh, just say a few things because I, if we have some time as well to also hear from, uh, from uh, our participants in the audience, I think that would be very yeah. good. So I'll just say a, a very br brief things uh, about, um, and I will uh, maybe take a continuation a little bit from uh, Mr. Aya, what you, you were mentioning as well. I, I was thinking that when we talk about partnerships for, for cities, whether it will be to some extent uh, nice or good to have or something you can say, a kind of a not, a, not a formal template, but some kind of a principle. So what could be good to remember when we talk about uh, partnerships? Um, because I think that, um, first of all, to choose the right partners and, and also understanding a little bit here about what we mean by right partners. To, to reflect on, on this uh, regarding the, the situation we will like to work in. And then also I think a uh, second uh, point could be that the partners sh somehow should have a jointly an implementation capacity. So when you put the partners together, they are able to uh, implement together. Um, and we also should uh, engage with partners when we take into account the partners, you can say institutional setup and the governance system um, because it will uh, need to be worked around uh, such setup, particularly when, of course, we, we look at the cities and the urban local bodies in India. So understand the uh, governance setup um, with the particular partner. And then uh, one more item which I would like to include here is uh, to look at the longer term sustainability of the partnership or after the partnership is ended, if you can say so. Um, as well as looking at working in the system as compared to working with individuals, but actually work in a partnership in a, s a systematic setup. And what I would like to mention the last item, which was also mentioned from Mr. Ayer, it is the definition of roles of the, of the uh, uh, parties in this partnership. So it is being clear about wh what, why are we together and what is it we, we each of us do in order to, you can say, um, maximize our um, joint implementation capacity. I'd like to do this very briefly. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ryan, being very economical on time. <laughs> Actually, we have a third kind of um, uh, section but I will try to open it and, you know, sort of join the two aspects of this um, uh, technical segment that we have. We were supposed to enter into a discussion by the panelists for them to engage on four questions. But I want to throw it open to the floor. And if you have questions, you can might as well direct them. But you are free to comment on the four issues that we are going to raise, which is relevant to the technical segment. Now, they're going to flag these two issues on the screen to help you know what they are. And please raise your hands, introduce yourself, and quickly, either you make a comment or you ask a question. Okay, here they are. I don't need to read it for you, so it's open. Yeah, do you have a microphone? Please introduce yourself briefly and say what you want to say briefly. We have to get out of this hall. I think in the next... Um, Five, ten minutes? Thank you, Chair. Yes. I'm Shalin Singhal, a professor at Terry School of Advanced Studies. And my question is uh, to the panelists. Very interesting pa presentations. Uh, how do you see the partnership arrangements between the cities and its stakeholders contributes towards one of the agenda which is sort of intangible, which is sustainable consumption, uh, despite of that being one of the SDGs 12? How does that contribute towards making cities more optimum on their consumption patterns? Thank you. Do, do we take um, uh, two or three questions before we 
I can uh, just uh, give one one input. Sustainable consumption uh, from uh, Danish side, as was mentioned uh, in the previous uh, session, we worked uh, with the city of Udaipur and the city of Aarhus, and we work on the sustainable urban water management. So here we will look, of course, at the water sector and uh, on the uses of the water. So we deal with. We, we want to contribute to SCD 11 and SCD 17 here, and 6, SCD 6. So we, we, are, we are working on this uh, water consumption in, in this setup, you can say. And that we are doing, looking at the water tariffs, looking at the leakage of the water, and the general water use in the household. Thank you. Wonderful. I, I think that would apply to the electricity consumption as well. The same approach, I guess. Anyone wants to... Deal with that or a new question or contribution, please go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Sanjeev. And uh, the, uh, now we are going to have one lay smart villages in terms of digital villages. So, any linkage with, between digital villages as well as digital cities and smart cities, I would like to say. So how exactly these digital villages may be a part of smart cities? So that at district level, we have got cluster of villages as well as cities to deal with whatever we are going to do and get benefited of. Okay. Anyone to dwell on the relationship between digital villages and smart cities? Somebody wants to talk about that? Okay. <laughs> Anand, you want to t take? Well, I'm not aware of this particular thing, but you know, these, um, the smart, the definition of smart, not in the mission. The mission does not go ahead to define, but one does know the measurable, actionable, you know. Um, one is often referring to the backbone, the, the, the way, the systems that you put in place so that the actions that you take are towards a purpose and are measurable as being towards the purpose. Now, this, the insertion of this particular backbone is something that is specific to the place. Now, there could be, maybe in an IT or something, there could be a, a kind of a stack approach that allows the different uh, parts of a place to be the same. Uh, there's a parallel that I can think of. We're, we're trying to do something in what's called the online building plan system. We're doing it for seven states in a stack approach because there might be cities that are considerably large and cities that are considerably small, the stack offers you the ability to plug in different platforms and on which different applications. So the building plan software is only an application that plugs into a, a platform which has all the engineers, etc., on it, and there is a stack that is able to take it. It's a kind of a hub that is able to take these things. It is not impossible, I think, to think of it, if one thinks of it from the IT kind of terminology, to have the basis that is similar, but I don't think it is necessary. It's not a necessary condition to have a smart village talking to a smart city just because they share a prefix. Yeah, but it is not impossible. Yeah. Hmm? Thank, thank you, thank you. I, I, I am uh, perhaps we don't have time, but I would have loved to know what digital villages are really. Yeah. <laughs> anyone, anyone want to say something to add? to whatever the panelists have said, or want to, there's a hand over there, please. Microphone, identify yourself for speaking. Alina, how much time do we have? I think another five minutes. Another five minutes, thank you. My, my question is a very simple question, though I am from an IT company, but uh, in every city, uh, the hygiene levels actually depend on uh, whether commercialization is uh, regulated properly or not. So what we see in even in city like Delhi is that uh, there is rampant uh, commercialization and within residential complexes, you will see there are shops opening, uh, opening go-downs are there. Uh, you know, in, in areas, uh, there have been also been small units of jewelry manufacturing which emit fumes, which are not good uh, for the community. And uh, when it comes to go-downs, then uh, there are repellents, there are rats that can pollute uh, the entire sewage system. Sometimes the local government machinery is so, uh, you know, not so active. What can organizations uh, or uh, you know, 
other allied organizations like yours or associations can help in that regard and you know how to treat this menace you want to say something here well i cannot comment on the local situation here of course uh, but um, um, in our experience um, in fact even though the commercialized areas as you call it it is government that takes care of the hygiene and that uh, in fact puts regulation in there so that the private partners do their fair share uh, so but that's in how we uh, tackle this in uh, in belgium so if there's a new area with uh, a lot of a commercial area for example we regulate how uh, how waste is being managed how uh, sewage is being managed if we give uh, uh, how do you call it a permit to build then it will be in all these regulations will be in there or you won't get the permit okay um, I, I just want to bring in my daughter is doing some research back home and um, uh, it's something to do with something in this direction and they are they're saying education is very important because you need community participation and you need to sensitize them so if they don't understand the medium of expression where you want to convey these messages it would not help, but to a great extent, sensitization about how to keep your environment clean with demonstrable experiences, I think, will go a long way in helping a sewage situation. That's just something that came to mind. Um, we have uh, three minutes more. Any contribution is welcome at this last minute. Otherwise, I will just conclude and thank you all for coming. With no hands up, I believe we've come to the end of this technical segment. I would like to really thank our dear panelists for investing some time in preparing for the I mean, um, uh, uh, segment and also for the contributions they have make, made. And thank you, dear attendees, for being with us and making this place full enough to show the interest manifested in the topic. Thank you, madam. Go, go ahead. Uh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Duru, for wrapping up so uh, well. And I would actually like to request you to please present tokens of appreciation to the panelists on our behalf, on behalf of UN Habitat and on behalf of Royal Embassy of Denmark. To uh, Mr. Mohammed Ridwani, thank you for coming. <laughs> the Honorable Mayor. <laughs> Mr. Anand Ayer. Ms. Shabnam Siddiqui and Ms. Camilla Christensen Rai. Thank you to our esteemed chair for posing the relevant questions and to understand the concert of partnerships better. <laughs>